relatives and family to dysfunction. So we'll allow them some time to arrive, but in the meantime, uh, let's get going. For those of us who knew uh, Dr. Luncheon, as we would call him popularly Roger, would know that there were certain characteristic features of the man who, or the comrade who we now celebrating. A humble man, very humble, uh, a man who was a servant of the people in many capacities, worst of all in the medical field. He has an outstanding career as a consultant at the public hospital, Georgetown. Uh, he never was interested in working at a private hospital. He always wanted to serve at the public hospital, and there's where he transitioned from the medical profession, not fully, to government business, a servant of the people in both the capacity as, as, uh, as a doctor, medical doctor, physician, and consultant, and then to the high office of the office of the president as the head of the presidential secretariat, among other responsibilities, which I'm sure uh, many of the speakers who are here this afternoon will tell you about. So those of us who worked with Dr. Luncheon or worked alongside him would have benefited enormously from his intellect. His intellect not only in the medical field, but wide ranging. And that was because he read a lot. And not only read a lot, he was listening and talking to people high and low in terms of the social ladder and social strata. Because as a doctor, his profession put him in contact with all kinds of people who came to the public hospital. And then as a politician, it also put him in touch with lots of people in this country. Because he walked the ground, as well as did his work quietly at the office of the president. So what we will do is to invite, start by inviting a few persons to speak while we await the family. And I wish now to begin by calling upon the Speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Manzo Nadir, to say a few words. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Clement. I will acknowledge our excellencies, the former presidents, and say friends of Roger. I first had an opportunity to interact closely with Roger in 2001, when His Excellency President Jagdio invited me to join the cabinet. All you could do with Roger, you wanted to many times ask yourself, who really run the country? Jagdio or Roger? Because he would be there from five o'clock or early in the morning till late at night on every subject and also quietly tutoring you and guiding you. So after a few years, one of my very uh, poignant time with Roger, I was in his office after we had to conduct some business after cabinet. So he took off his glasses and he had a problem with a particular minister. And he started cleaning it. And he looked in and he said, Manzur, you don't teach these cats anything. They don't leave themselves no rigor room. I was in Trinidad in, I think it was 2004, 
for our Republic celebrations. Our law students annually would do a Guyana night at law school. And they would throw on a very good show. I think that would have been the year when Henry Green was at U. Wooding Law School. And I met a minister from Trinidad there. And he was saying that the UE communication classes ask their students to look at Roger Luncheon's weekly press conferences in terms of communicating with people. And so the impact of Roger is not only to our national development, and you're going to, you're going to hear a lot about that, but wider field, because he not only touched Caribbean leaders, but beyond. And it's simple persons like Roger who just dedicate themselves to service of nation. Roger said to me once, you know who bring me back to Guyana? Hamilton Green. Hamilton Green. And they were somewhere in Brooklyn and he said he was sitting on a motorcycle and I'm sure Harry Gill would know that, being a good friend of Hammy himself. And that's how Roger came back. Came back to work with Hammy Green and end up being a colleague of Chetty and Janet Jagan and serving this country till he passed away a few weeks ago. So on behalf of a very grateful nation, my family and I, our condolences to a great champion of Guyana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mansoor. I'm sure as the speakers uh, share with you their experiences with doc, about Dr. Luncheon, those of you who knew him personally, and those of you who heard about him, and those of you who saw him on TV, because he was almost every week on TV after cabinet meetings giving uh, what is called uh, cabinet briefings after he would have gotten directions from the president at the time and understanding of what was decided by the cabinet because as cabinet secretary he had to be able to articulate as best as he could and represent the views of cabinet or the decision of cabinet in such a way that it would not create difficulties between himself and the, and the president um, whom he served. And incidentally, um, he served many presidents. He served Dr. Chedi Jagan as president. He served Mr. Janet Jagan as president. He served Hines. Sam Hines. Sorry, he served Dr. Sam Hines as president. He, solved, uh, he served uh, Dr. Bar Jagdio as president, I think, for the longest while. And then he moved on to the President Ramatar. So that brings me to the next speaker, who will now be former President Dal Ramatar. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Chairman. Members of the government, relatives and friends of Roger. Kumbadzal, good afternoon. Today we are meeting to celebrate the life of one of our finest sons in this country. A man who gave of himself unselfishly and unstintingly to work to improve people's lives. And I believe to understand what made Roger, the person he became, I, I believe that it had to do 
with probably the time of his birth, a time when we were fighting for freedom, for independence, and I think that helped to form the character that became Roger Luncheon. Many things have been said about him already since he passed away. But what was a constant, running like a red thread through everyone's comment, is his service to humanity, his modesty, he was modest almost to a fault, and his never losing touch with the common people. He was always there. And maybe he felt in his young age that one of the best ways to contribute to the poor people of Guyana was to become a doctor. And like every other thing that he doubled with, he became a doctor par excellence. And he was uh, a really dedicated doctor, a fine man of example, a man who saw the profession from its humanitarian point of view. And he did not go into the medical profession to get rich. Roger could have been extremely rich because he was a sought after doctor. And he was, but he always give his service to the public hospital. And the way he also carried himself he was most respected at the hospital. I have some very small personal experience of that because my wife was a nurse and she worked for some time with Dr. Luncheon and not even now she still speak about him at the bedside of the patients and the amount of family that he had and everybody with the auntie and nenen and so forth for luncheon and the time he spent with his patient. I also had another personal experience with him as a doctor. He used to be my mother's doctor in the early 80s. And when I went abroad, the party sent me abroad to Prague she still used to go to him at the public hospital. But she used to feel embarrassed that when she went to see Roger and he knows that she's out there, he will bring her in and skip the line and there's always almost as much people as you see here waiting to see Dr. Luncheon. And she felt embarrassed about that and she stopped going and went to other doctors in our society. But when I came back home and she was getting sick and we didn't know what was happening to her, we took her to many other doctors. She asked me if she could, I could make arrangement for her to see Dr. Luncheon again. And it was a Sunday and I was coming to town and I decided to stop home at Raja in Kitty and told him, he said, well, bye, I ain't doing nothing now, let me go. And we went and catch a bus on the road and we went all the way to High Flock to see my mom, where he diagnosed her with stomach cancer. So we had, and that was his way, as I mentioned in one of the early tributes I paid to him, that he was riding a bicycle, going to work as a doctor, and I don't think he ever bought a car because when he began to serve in government, he began to use government car. And his work habits were of such that he used to go to work very early. So I don't think he used to send for his driver. And you know, he didn't have such good eyesight. And he had a lot of accidents on the road. I think he write off a couple of government cars in that you know, early morning going to work. Till eventually he was convinced and he stopped driving to go to work at, at four and five o'clock in the morning. So he, as I said, as an example, an in-government service, I think he decided to go in government for several reasons. Because I believe he saw 
some of the same qualities that he had. I believe he saw some of that in Dr. Jagan, his modesty and his cheap, well, this is maybe a strong word, maybe not the best word to use, it's cheapness, Roger was pretty cheap too, you know, and um, very economical with, um, with money and so forth. And I believe that probably was part of the, apart from this, his ideological development, I think that that was part of the attraction that he had not, not to waste things and to see what, what best you could do. But he was a brave man. The time when he joined the People's Progressive Party, the party had nothing to offer but, but struggle. And at that period, an Afro-Guyanese joining the party was opening themselves to ridicule and people to attack them and call them Kudis Stooge and all of that. And many of our comrades, great comrades, had to face that battle from the time the party began, from Brindy Ben to EMG Wilson, right down the line, and Roger faced some of that himself. Yet, many of those who made those type of accusations against him have never been closer to the ordinary working class people as Roger did. Roger, of course, he had strong sympathy for black causes, genuine black causes, but he also had strong sympathy. He had a class position as well that made him go across the board to look at the poor, the working people. That was his conviction and that motivated him. And that is why he went across the board. I believe he was one of the persons in our society who could probably walk into any house in Guyana and be welcomed because of his own, his rooted in class and rooted in trying to get the interests of the people. And that is why I think that he, when the PPP came to government in 1992, that he decided to go into the public service and to become the head of the public service because I'm sure that he, he thought that it is in this way that he can cure more people than only by being a doctor in trying to cure some of the ills of the society. And that was his focus. To use another comrade, another old comrade who is not doing too well now in health as well, but I think this, these words capture some of the character of Raj, Raja. Robert Collymore always used to say, I'm a socialist, not a socialite. And Roger was not a socialite. In fact, he was very clumsy in some social, um, some social conditions. I remember one incident that has stayed with me, probably happened in the 80s, late 80s. He called, we were talking about one thing or the other, then he said he was, um, the, the afternoon he was going to a wedding. He was invited to a wedding and he got, he got a gift for the wedding. I asked him, what gift you got, boy? He said, he got a pants linked. I said, but Roger, nobody don't give pants linked to a wedding, to have a wedding present to anybody. You got to go and get them like an electric iron or, 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 or something for the household. Then Roger decided to abandon his pants like to go and get <laughs> to go and, and get something for the household. Because he was not it's largely because he don't be around to a lot of these social parties a lot and and he didn't have that kind of experience. So he thought just once he gave a gift, maybe he, he was of the view that uh, is the thought that count. Maybe that's what <laughs> But I told him that that was a clumsy thing, man. You can't give the man a pass <laughs> for the wedding. But he was a wonderful comrade. He worked really very hard. He dedicated himself. He loved his family. He loved his children. He sacrificed a lot in bringing them up to being mother and father sometimes for them. He was a true human being, true and true. 
They're very, very rare. You will see Roger angry. And I think that is one of the quality that he had. That's why ordinary people felt comfortable in going up and talking to him about any issues or problems that they had, whether it is in their own personal issues, government issues, or medical issues. He will surely be missed. He served the service that the quality of service that he gave. I don't think that it can ever, you can ever put a monetary sum to it. And I hope that we popularize his example more and more. For when you're hearing some people charging millions of dollars to do things for the ordinary human being, that was not Roger. Roger's mission in life and I would say mission accomplished. And he would surely rest in peace because he, he did his best in the service of mankind. And our country is far better off because of the service of comrades like Dr. Luncheon. I thank you for your attention. There was an activity that was held at Freedom House a few weeks ago in honor of Ashton Chase, which was chaired by Gail DeShera. And Gail uh, very effectively uh, decided how much time a person should speak, for how long. So I think I'll take as an example from Gail. Um, of course, a woman could be much more, you know, um, that could do that very much better than a man could do it. Men tend to be more direct, but a woman or a lady such as Gail could probably do it much more effectively than I could. But I nevertheless learned a thing or two from her. Now, in 1992, when the People's Progressive Party um, was elected to office with Dr. Jagan as the president. He sat with the leadership of the party, as is normally the case, to establish uh, the ministerial portfolios. And Dr. Jagan, the president at the time, he identified Dr. Luncheon as the the Holy Portfolio of Health, Minister of Health. I mean, it, it, it would seem to logic, it would seem logical to most of us that Roger would will fill that portfolio very effectively. But before that meeting took place, Dr. Jagan and Mr. Hoyt, who's the outgoing president, decided that, look, we need to have two persons sit down and establish how the transition would take place. Because they never had it before. With boredom, everything was cut and dry. And so Dr. Luncheon, Roger, was identified as the person representing the president who would sit with, I think it was, Cedric Joseph or Tyron Ferguson, one of the two, Gail would know better which one, I can't remember which one, but either of the two of them, and negotiate the transition. Now that was very important because from since then, when it came to government business, the question of trust was extremely important for a president. Who did you trust? to assign that responsibility to negotiate the transition from one government to the next. And Roger effectively fulfilled that responsibility, that, that task. And so when Dr. Jagan identified him to be the Minister of Health, Roger politely declined. He politely declined and said, <laughs> I would not wish to be a minister in the government. I would wish to, if you agree with me, Mr. President, to be the HPS, 
and that was it. He became the HPS and has been the HPS with every president up to the time of when he was no longer serving as the HPS. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> so, I mentioned that period because the next speaker that I intend to call upon served in the first cabinet of the government of President Jagan. Um, he's no longer, like myself, serving government, but maybe in a different capacity. And I'd like to now invite um, Comrade Harry Passad Nocta. Where is he? Come, Harry. Yes, yeah, please step forward to see you in your red jersey. Comrade Harry Passad Nocta served in the first cabinet, which Dr. Luncheon was head of the presidential secretariat for and was like a rock to make sure that that, that the ship was sailing smoothly. Harry, please. Thank you, Comrade Rohi. Children and relatives of the deceased, party comrades, friends, ladies and gentlemen, when Sham, my son, gave me the sad note that Dr. Lonchan passed away, I could not help but shedding some tears. I knew Dr. Lonchan for so many years, and all the time we met, I never addressed him as doctor. I say, Roger, that's how I address him, Roger. But I knew him as a doctor in the very early days when my mother got sick and was at the public hospital, Georgetown. Dr. Luncheon was the doctor who attended to her and gave me the sad, sad news that Harry by, you got to think ahead. The old lady is on the way out. It was a sad piece of information. But as a doctor, he gave me the true picture. Thereafter, I happened to see Dr. Roger Luncheon and to meet him on many, many occasions. And what are the things I will never forget? And that is, as a doctor, he was already always kind to people whom he knew were not in the best of health. He will sometimes ask you, how you do? Are you doing good? And that is what Dr. Luncheon did to me on many, many occasions. I want to say that I worked with Dr. Luncheon for many, many years. And there are certain things which, although we were so much closely associated, we will be at the political meetings. Raja, on very occasions, he would like to take the microphone and speak out. On very many occasions, we will ask Dr. Luncheon, come and sit down in front. And he will say, man, let them boys go in front. He's so humble, but he took his task very serious. He served, from my knowledge, he served five presidents, if I'm right. And from the time I became a member of the cabinet, I visited Dr. Lonchan, Raja, I visited Raja. Every time I walk up the steps of the office of the president, I must go and see Raja, even to say, Raja, how you do? And I go to take my seat. 
we were so close together and because of that i want to say that rajya has been part of my life we worked together and i remember there are many occasions we will meet at rallies at big public meetings and what is surprising raja even when he has to attend and he cannot go on his own raja will sit in a wheelchair and travel from george town to babujan to listen and attend these public occasions raja and me we were so close but there are certain things which i could not get raja to do and does matter how the meetings are successful and how the crowd is big and when the boys will come around and say let me go and take a drink raja will tell me hurry you go ahead boy god is not his line he does not but he mixed in company with so many of us and today i want to join with all of you in remembering this very close comrade in fact i record refer to him as my brother the comrade who is sitting there every time i call her from the time he went into hospital i will call home and first thing i wish ask is how is my body how is my body and raja in life i regard him as a body and i join with you in remembering this very close comrade of ours for me i have lost a body i want to extend my condolences and to wish all his children and loved ones a peace of mind so that they can overcome the grief and sorrow and the loss of a loved one and for me a loss of a body comrade thank you very much for this opportunity thank you comrade harry uh um, let's move to our next speaker who will be the person who I referred to just now as chairing the meeting at Freedom Out that she exercised the hatchet on the time which she could speak. So I hope that she will impose that on herself too. Come with Gail the Shearer. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm afraid to say to Comrade Rohi that my concern about speaking and my nervousness about speaking wasn't only because to talk about Roger, but also as fearful that there was so much to talk that I couldn't keep within my own timelines that I gave at that meeting that my comrade is referring to. We're given one life to live, only one life. and my comrade my friend my confidant roger lunchen used every every facet everything he was given to make the life the best and to make a change in our country everything his soul his spirit his objectives were to be a force to change our country to make it better to see us united it took an amazing amount of courage particularly as a black comrade he was humble as everyone has said and the joke between us is that he had no ego he didn't understand what it was to be egotistical he had pride and dignity So when we talk about Roger we must recognize this was a man who had tremendous amount of 
pride and respect for people, but also for himself. And he would not sell himself short. Roger came out of the 60s as a young man when the United States, when he went to university, was on fire. The civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and this had a lot to do with his social and political consciousness long before he reached Guyana. And remembered in fond ways those days and, and the struggles and also the fact that the world hadn't changed enough. But as his strength, I don't think we realize that Roger was a super specialist in medicine. He was an internist and a nephrologist. And the time when he came back to Guyana, thanks to Prime Minister, then Prime Minister and Minister of Health, Hamilton Green's invite, was he was the only nephrologist in the entire Caribbean. So we had a super specialist in our midst who basically got paid what was probably about $1,000 a month, who had a bicycle that he rode to and from the hospital and got the reputation in the hospital of being the man who ate Solara every Friday and in fact one tray of it. This comrade of ours and this man that we all know different facets of, when the history of this country is written, it has to have a very big component to do with Roger Luncheon. He served five presidents and then in this last presidency, Irfan Ali, he served loyally all the presidents. They say that the head that wears the crown is heavy, but I'll say that the crown that is supported by others is also heavy. Roger took his responsibilities with utmost dedication and commitment and loyalty. And so the political annals of our country, the period of the transition in 92, the period of 97 post-elections, and the period between 92 and 97, setting up the government with a whole bunch of ministers who had never, ever been in public service before. The period after that, and the troubles and the violence of 97 and 2001, and the role that Roger played to help to return some normalcy to our country with the other political leaders. The role he played in CARICOM with interlocutor post-1997, where the famous meetings we had every week, every month, sorry, we'd go to Pegasus and have a meeting, a uh, bipartisan meeting with the PNC. And Roger's famous request of Pegasus was that one bowl of sugar was not enough for him, much less for the six of us. So there was always an extra bowl of sugar just for Roger. And of course, post that, the difficulties of 2001, 2006, the crime wave of 2002 to 2008, and again, the period when we were in minority government. There is no phase of the history of contemporary Guyana, which Roger wasn't a part of. Personally, I have lost a friend, not just a comrade. Um, I have missed the discussions at one and two in the morning, which was the only time we could kind of find to talk to each other. And of course, my annoyance when talking to him at one o'clock, because I'm a night owl and therefore I come alive in the evening, um, and uh, not, I'm not good at five in the morning. But we would have these discussions, and I'd realize I'd suddenly hear snoring on the end of the phone. Roger had fallen asleep and left, abandoned me. And so, <laughs> including times when I would be very riled up, and some of you who know me, know that I can get wax and get very het up and quarrel. And Roger, God bless his soul, was the only person I know in my life who would allow me to rant and rave <clears throat> and vent 
and explain my frustration, and he would listen and listen and listen and eventually come out with some words of wisdom, such as, girl, keep at it, just keep going. And again, there were times when I ranted and raved that he just fell asleep on me again. I had to wonder what kind of woman am I when the men are falling asleep on me all the time. But, <laughs> but Roger and I had a particular relationship which I've never had with anybody else. And that is, we understood how to play Good afternoon, sir. I, I have to keep my time, which I gave everybody. But to only say this, that the synergy sometimes between Roger and I were very clear. And that is why I find it difficult to talk and to, to figure out which part of the relationship should I speak about. And there are many facets of Roger, my comrade, a political leader, Roger, a governmentalist, as he called himself, a generalist. Roger, the human being, the man, the friend, the father. It is difficult. But there was a certain thing that we did, and I reminded him the last time I saw him, and he laughed. We decided that in government, both of us couldn't be good cops or both of us couldn't be bad cops. And so different meetings, we would be good or bad. And in that meeting, whatever the meeting was, whether it was diplomats or internally, we knew which one was a good cop. Unfortunately, Roger was always a good cop and I was a bad cop because he would start off the meeting being very nice and managing people well and negotiating and therefore I would the one have to come in with the the tough line sometimes um, and it became a joke between us this life that Roger lived is one that I hope will be a, an example to the young people of our country the young leaders of our party and even leaders outside of our party of what it is to be a leader, to be committed and loyal and disciplined, totally disciplined, and to give as much as you can give for the betterment of our society, of our nation, of our people. There is no greater gift that a human can give than Roger gave, and therefore, I hope that when all of the young people hear this, the greatest tribute to Roger would be for the young leaders, the young ministers, the young people to see that you can serve, serve our country, make it a better place, have your mark on it, and be still a wonderful human being, caring and loving and strong and brave. And so, thank you, Roger, for everything, and for the children and the family of Dr. Luncheon and Shaleen and June, my friend of the past. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Gill. That was very much unlike traditional Gil Teixeira, short and sweet. Welcome, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker we call upon is the former Prime Minister of this country who served uh, in the cabinet of this country to work with Dr. Luncheon for a number of years and is now serving as a distinguished ambassador in Washington at the Guyana Embassy, Mr. Sam Hines. Former president also. Thank you. Thank you very much, 
Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, fellow presidents, in particular our current Vice President, and all my old colleagues and friends. Uh, my wife and I, when we got the news last uh, on the Wednesday morning, my clock rang at uh, 6 o'clock, 6.30, and looked at my phone, and there was something from Robeson Bent, and it said, uh, Roger has passed. So we immediately thought that we would need to get down here and join with all of you here in recalling Roger. What I find, though, is that even though we worked very closely over a number of years, remembering particulars has been, doesn't come easy, I guess it's my way of working intensely and get past one job and there's another job coming up. Uh, after 1990, there was that long period of campaigning and I know that we were out there in the in Region 10 area, which has its particular challenges. And I see Neil Kumar looking on, and he recalls some of the events in that time, getting into Arima and finding that we were not quite welcome. And another time, myself and Roger, and I think Neil, uh, got into a Coryal, Coryal. I think maybe the first time I got into a Coryal, and if you ever did, you know you have to kind of ride it like riding a bicycle. So there was Roger and I on it, and it was going all over the place. And uh, we were scared for a while, a while there. But Roger was, throughout this period, a go-to person. I think all members of cabinet found him to be the person to go to when you had an issue. Uh, he kind of kept the door to the president. And I can tell you, after Chedi passed, and uh, there was something with a Guyanese guy who had got involved in some matters in Trinidad, which he claimed turned out to be not what he thought. And he was, came back to Guyana and was a little bit in uh, uh, secure places or something. And, uh, Roger said, let me tell you about it. I don't think I even told Chedi about it. He had a policy, he said, of keeping the president in a state of credible deniability. Uh, I think he kind of supervised a weekly report that came out, some kind of security report. And I remember when Janet became president about after about a month or so, reading this, seeing these weekly reports, it is said she threw one away and she said, I know more, I can get more on the street of what is happening in Ghana that I'm getting from this security report. And again, uh, uh, Roger's response was, you have to keep the president in a state of credible deniability. He was, he was interesting in his logic and his turn, turn of phrase. I recall when his own challenges came along, he said, uh, <clears throat> and in my circumstances too, with some, some health issues, he said, you don't want to know things that you can't do anything about. But um, on some specifics in the area of electricity, when we came into office, electricity was a big problem. We got our first two Wartzilla units in, and then we had a crash, and at least I felt relieved. He led the way in, in making the case for another four units, and this was a time when we just didn't have any money. So it was, it, it was quite a challenge he led there uh, to, to, to get the uh, funding for those uh, units. I think to a large extent he bridged, he bridged many of the, many of the gaps in our 
country, particularly acknowledgeably, the racial gap, and uh, uh, I would say his, he and many of others uh, experienced some of the uh, difficulties in being with the People's Progressive Party in the context of Guyana, and uh, particularly at that time. Uh, to some extent, we had some kind of family relationships, and so maybe I was more aware, or as aware as many others, of those sorts of issues. Uh, I, know, I think he's, I read that uh, he's one of ten siblings, and the other nine did not quite, were not quite happy with his political positioning. We were not quite happy about it, but so it is. That's one of the facts of our, of our country. Uh, we'll all certainly miss uh, Roger. When I was here in uh, May, I took the opportunity. I had to go and look him up. And he looked quite thin and small, and there was a nurse doing physio with him and moving his arms and massaging him. So I said to him, as, as she retreated, I said to him, I'm sure, Roger, that you'd prefer to have the young lady massaging you and moving your arms about rather than me coming to talk about old political kind of things. He said, maybe, but I can't see. I can't see the young lady, so it didn't matter as much. So I think we'll all miss him, and I certainly miss him quite a lot as a colleague and as someone with whom we have long links, uh, going back a long way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade Sam. Now, I will call on Comrade Pauline Sukai. Is she there? Pauline, please step forward. And, um, you know the time limit, right? Because there are a lot of speakers. I'm going to be very brief. His Excellencies, um, former presidents of our country, um, colleague ministers, the family of Dr. Roger Luncheon, um, comrades, and everyone who has taken the time out to be here. I will be very brief. Um, I want to share a few of the personal times I think that I've shared with Dr. Luncheon. Many, many others already before spoke of him being a medical doctor, and indeed, he really displayed what a doctor should be like. For example, when my, one of my father got ill in February of 2002, that my father has never been to a hospital in over 70 years or thereabout. He's always been healthy, firm, and so on. And so when he took ill, I couldn't get him to go to the doctor. But eventually I did, and he went to Dr. Balwan Singh Hospital. But he wasn't satisfied, he didn't want to stay, period. So he said he's not staying, and we had a hard time trying to get him treated. And so I took him to Dr. Luncheon, and I visited Kitty. And Dr. Luncheon spoke to him, and he brought him down to a level where he understood that he should, you know, be medically examined. And Dr. Luncheon examined him, and one of Dr. Luncheon remarked to him was, you're 80 years old, but you are in the body of an 18-year-old guy. That's what he mentioned to my father, and it started off like that. So Dr. Luncheon really was also a confidant to myself. If I have an issue, political or otherwise, I felt very comfortable speaking with Dr. Luncheon on anything. And he would say, girl, Pauline, let me tell you this thing. And he will, you know, make me feel as though we mattered. And so as a leader in terms of being a medical practitioner, a politician, 
a friend. He was a truly a patriot for this country. And I will follow in the words of Minister Gale when she alluded to the fact that the young people of this country should emulate the level of commitment, responsibility, dedication to country as Dr. Luncheon did. And so I have many stories um, that I would like to tell, but we have a time limit. Um, but one small thing is that I had an experience to be among Dr. Luncheon on an overseas trip. And uh, again, Dr. Luncheon proved to be like a rock. And so to the family, to those who were very close to him and knew him better than I did, I want to say he will be missed. And uh, Guyana will forever um, have a space in all of our hearts for Dr. Luncheon. Thank you, Pauline. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker will be someone from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, the HPS under the aegis of the presidency has wide responsibility to oversee all these different sectors to make sure things are going smoothly. So I now invite uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Harper, the Director General of PS of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to say a few words. Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, former President, uh, Vice President, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, members of the family and friends of Dr. Luncheon. I recall the first time I met the HPS. It was in the compound of Tacuba Lodge one evening around, might have been seven, um, he was with Ambassador Miles, who at the time was Director General. And uh, I stood and listened to them talk, and she was negotiating. We always, as uh, Mr. Rohi said, were always negotiating something for foreign affairs. And uh, when he left, I said to her, how come you got him to come over to foreign affairs? And she said, I think he just wanted another environment to breathe in for the time being, and I got him to come over. And then I realized that he had developed a special relationship, working relationship with Ambassador Miles. And, uh, I was privileged when I became Director General to also be able to uh, learn from him. Uh, he respected the views that we brought to him from the ministry. We didn't always get our own way, but he was always gracious in saying no. And uh, I remember him even at meetings with the permanent secretaries where we would always listen and, and try to understand uh, a lot of the times what he was trying to tell us because sometimes he would be direct and other times he would say things to you that you would have to go back to your desk and try to unravel exactly what it was he told us to do, just like many of his press conferences that were referred to. But I believe that he has left a mark on the public service. He has left a mark on the heads of agencies who worked under him, and I, I, I'm sure I can speak for all of them, past and present, um, how much we admired him and respected him 
And uh, even when I got a call from him, I was always excited to answer, to hear what it was he wanted me to do, um, what advice he wanted me to say. I, I remember one time I told him, you know, I, I think we should, why don't we change this policy? It was a particular policy I was talking to him about. He said, girl, nah, man, left it so. And then he went on to explain to me why, in my wisdom, we ought not to go that route. But I, I also want to share with you that um, I would never forget the support that he gave to me when I was uh, asked to be the prime ministerial candidate in 2015, uh, which I was honored to accept. And uh, he was so supportive of me, and uh, he would call me and talk to me. And I would never forget the things that he has said to me. Uh, up to now, they have stayed with me. And uh, I hold him in deep respect, as I know all of you here do. And uh, I wish his family God's comfort at this time of grief. It is not easy, but just know that you are in our thoughts and prayers. And uh, may his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, DG Harper. We're making progress. Uh, we have two more speakers before we end this particular session and then go to an open session. So the next speaker, um, I can't to Dr. Lunch anywhere else. Banners, let me then discuss this thing, would be Mr. Mark Phillips, Prime Minister Mark Phillips. I think you work with Dr. Lunch. So please, you're invited to say a few words. Thank you, Comrade Clement. Your Excellency, President Ali, former President, Prime Minister, Ministers of Government, Comrades all, good evening. Um, first of all, let me express my deepest sympathy to the family of Dr. Roger Forbes' luncheon. And, uh, you know, my entire family, immediate family, know Dr. Luncheon well. You know, my wife and children. And uh, I have a dilemma in the sense that this is the force of three nights of reflection that I'll be attending and I will have to make remarks tonight. Uh, tomorrow night I'll be in Linden, and Sunday night we have a night of reflection at the Ghana Defense Force headquarters. You know, <clears throat> so my first interaction with Dr. Luncheon would have been in the late 90s when I was the Staff Officer 1 G2 basically the intelligence officer of the Ghana Defense Force. And every Wednesday, there was a national um, a Central Intelligence Committee meeting. And uh, that meeting started at 7. And being the most junior person at that meeting, you know, the chief of staff, the commissioner of police used to be there. And being the most junior staff officer, I was normally torn up at about 6.30 for the 7 o'clock meeting. And Doc was already there with his coffee brewing. So we shared coffee and uh, we shared a lot of conversation until the other, you know, senior officers come to the meeting, join the meeting. And many a times, you know, a number of issues that was pertinent to the young officers, I took the opportunity to raise with Doc. And he will go through all these issues and, you know, have solutions that I can now take to the chief of staff to discuss. And, uh, you know, when we have these discussions, there's plenty banners, you know, he like to use the word banners. Banners, when he use the word banners, is 
is reasoning, deep thinking that will arrive at a workable solution that I can take back. Then the next instance, I was a lieutenant colonel, a new appointment, colonel administration and quartering. Um, Vice President Jack Dale was the president then. And for some reason, the powers of being a GDF saw it fit to send me forward to deal with all the matters, the heady matters, the tenuous matters. So here I was, the current administration on quartering, again meeting with Dr. Luncheon on a frequent basis, discussing the finances of the GDF. And uh, again, very perceptive, very incisive, and every time we would have had those encounters, I would have returned to the Chief of Staff with more than he expected. Dr. Luncheon was, in my mind, a genius with regards to defense and security of Guyana. And more than that, when everyone in the cabinet would have questioned everything about the GDF, Dr. Luncheon was the defender of the GDF. And he explained everything to President Jack Dio and the cabinet, leaving the GDF better off than we would have started before those discussions. And uh, thirdly, there was a proud moment for me when President Ramatar and Dr. Luncheon promoted me from Cornell to Brigadier and appointed me as Chief of Staff. That relationship with Dr. Luncheon that led to the development, the progressive development of the Ghan Defense Force continued until 2015, May 2015, when we had the change of government. After then, it was basically a personal relationship between myself and Dr. Luncheon. You know, we will exchange texts on a number of issues, if there were anything affecting him that he felt the new Prime Minister could deal with, he will text the Prime Minister, and I consider it duty to get it done. All of us here will remember Dr. Luncheon, and I can assure you that everyone in the Ghana Defense Force will remember Dr. Luncheon. And it's very important, that's how we saw it, and we see it as being very important that there must be a special night of reflection for Dr. Luncheon on Sunday night. Again, may his soul rest in peace, and we continue to be in support of you, his family, during this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, PM. Now we need to give the family a moment to share with us their thoughts uh, following the death of Dr. Luncheon. So I'll ask June Ward, who we know June, to say a few words on behalf of the family. Thank you, Kamar Ruhi, Your Excellency, all the comrades who are past presidents, Prime Minister. Um, my tribute is going to be very personal. Um, I had a very multifaceted relationship with Roger. Um, we were partners. We were colleagues. We were comrades and we were friends. I met Roger soon after he came back when I had a sick uncle, and my aunt, who lived in New York at the time, called and said that she had spoken to his father, Rani, who said that his son had just got back to Guyana and that I should take my uncle to see him. 
I did that. I went to the Georgetown Hospital. I took my uncle. And of course, we started talking. And he took care of my uncle's health, including arranging for him to go to the United States to seek further attention. One thing led to another, and the relationship between Raj and I changed. Gail left out a little bit of information. Um, the next thing I knew, we were visiting each other. And he, at the time, he lived at the government flats in Kwamina Street. And so in visiting him, I would stop at Freedom House and buy the mirror before I got there. And that continued. Then, at some point in time when the relationship got a little more serious, I called Gail and said to her, look, I would met this guy, and um, I thought that he would be somebody who we could encourage to come into the party. And I arranged a dinner meeting at which I invited Gail. We had a good time. And basically, that was the introduction. Now, when I, when I came back in, in 1977, I came, I was an international civil servant. I worked with the UN at the time. And when, I, when I'd spoken to Comrade Chetty about what kind of activities I could get involved in, he suggested, well, of course, I couldn't get involved in political activity because I was an international civil servant. So Comrade Chetty, in his wisdom, recommended the Peace Council, the Friendship Societies, and that kind of thing. So after Gail and I met Roger, we kind of figured that that was the kind of thing that he could start doing. And I remember um, being very active at the time in the Guyana Cuba Friendship Society, and we used to have a lot of fundraising events, and I would invite him, he'd come along, and, and things were. But that was not enough for Roger. We, we were also actively involved in the support committees for the African liberation struggles at the time. And so Roger got involved in that. And the next thing I knew, Roger abandoned all of that and got fully involved in day-to-day -day politics. Um, very wisely, he and I agreed <laughs> that we would alter the partnership so that the friendship and the camaraderie could thrive. And I think that was one of the best decisions we made. <laughs> because we continued as comrades and as friends until he passed. I left, came back. I remember when I, I was at the time in working in Delhi, when I got the news that we had won the election in 92. And, and he was the first person I called. Gail was the second person to find out what was happening. And he said, when you come in. Um, I subsequently came back in 94, and not to work with him, but I ended up working with him as his deputy for six years. No, that's another experience. <laughs> but I, I, I watched Roger, I, my, my introduction to him was as a doctor. And even at the time when we lived together, he would, people would be coming to the house at 2 o'clock, in the house at 2 o'clock in the morning, and people would come up the street. And I remember one time his daughter Sharon coming to me and saying, do you know that this lady just came in there and he's, has, he's examining her on my bed? <laughs> that, that was Roger. Um, I was involved in some MGO work, and I would ask him to come along on weekends to villages, and we would just set up, and we would do medical clinics all over the place. That was Roger. He volunteered with the Lions Club at one time doing medical outreach. 
until he got involved, fully, fully, fully involved in government. Comrade Cherry, I think, Comrade Rohi, Comrade Barat. I'm just talking about the strange nature of Roger. Comrade Rohi and Comrade Barat <laughs> accompanied Comrade Cherry to a, on a delegation to India, and at the time I was living there. And Roger is the only man I have ever seen with a shirt jack and a jacket over it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was winter in Delhi. He had no winter clothes. He had, that, that was it. A short jack and uh, just jack. Yeah. But I think Roger has made a major contribution not only to Guyana, but to, the, to humanity. He, with, with many sacrifices, his children will, will, will probably talk about that. Um, but while I worked at OP, we used to have a, a Wednesday night meeting at State House. And he would tag along to Mika and, and Tandy to the meeting if he didn't have a babysitter. And he would just put them there, feed them, and put them there to sleep. And the meeting will go on from 7 to 10, and he wasn't, you know, that was it. Talk about 6 o'clock in the morning meetings. I hated him for that. But he would, it was as if he was doing this deliberately. <laughs> he was a workaholic. I've never seen Roger. As, as a doctor, he worked every day. It did not matter if it was Christmas, Independence. He worked every day. And I remember one time, they called ICU, calling him out, and him just picking up his bag and running there. And when he got to the hospital, he realized he wasn't wearing shoes. So he just went along and did what he had to do, and that was it. Yeah. And this, this was Roger. He gave his entire life. I used to tell him that he needed some balance, and he would always say, go all around with you. I doing all right. Um, but he, I think he has, he's a, is, is an example of humility, loyalty, friendship. I wish many of us could live like him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, June. Now, we have another speaker this afternoon. And there are two things that I want to briefly say about him. Uh, when the, there was a major rally of the People's Progressive Party to launch its campaign uh, at the Kitty Market Square, and Roger was the chairman. And Roger stood up there and said to the crowd, he said, you know, the People's Progressive Party, we had CBJ or CJ. We had JJ. And now we got BJ. <laughs> and of course, you know, the crowd went wild. He is introducing Bar Jagdio. And then as the presidential candidate at the Kitty Market Square meeting. That's one political side, but it's a lighter side that June didn't mention. Roger was a bad dance man. The fellow could dance. Every time they got a dance at Freedom House, he was there on the floor. And don't talk about the shots. He could dance. That was the lighter side of luncheon apart from what June spoke about, the hard-working, alcoholic side of him. So that's the man. But to speak authoritatively, if there's one person in this audience that could speak authoritatively about Dr. Luncheon, is former president, Bar Jack Liu, now vice president. Bar Jack Liu, please. Mr. President, colleagues, friends, and especially members of the family. Uh, tonight, I 
want to, as General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, to thank you for attending this night of reflection organized by the party. We appreciate your presence. Dr. Luncheon meant a lot for the people of this country, and he served them faithfully, and he served the governments, <coughs> successive PVP governments, in a very important position. But he was also an important leader of our party. And I do not think from the time I've entered into senior leadership in the party that there has been an, any important decision made by the party that Dr. Luncheon did not have a say in. And so tonight we have heard a lot of personal experiences and people's relationship with Roger. And I'm sure in this audience, there are many people who may not speak here tonight, but whose lives he has touched by helping them in one form or another. In the last maybe years, Roger Luncheon struggled um, he struggled, and there were many people who stood by his side and helped to manage some of the difficulties he was going through. And I want to thank all of them for taking care of Roger. Shalene, we talk more to Shalene, but there are many others too. But Shalene, we want to thank you. For us, it was, for me personally, I didn't want to engage Roger a lot. Because every time I saw him or talked to him, I couldn't help but feeling, feel sad. That in this frail body, a person who lost his sight, was trapped this great intellect. And it is such a waste to this world. And people, he'll come to the party meetings, and our executive meeting is often held on the fourth, fourth floor of the party that APNU used to spread a rumor that it was a torture chamber for afro Guyanese, And um, he'll come to the meetings, and then someone would piggyback Roger up the three flights of stairs. And looking at that, you know, we just, you gloss over it. But when you really see this person who had done so much for the country and had the capacity to do much, much more. The experience, the intellect, everything else. And, and the drive, but not supported by the body. Then it's a loss. And so tonight, I want to say at the People's Progressive Party level, we've had many changes. I'm sure Roger would have been happy to see what is happening in our party today. We heard about, and the president will not speak tonight because he'll speak on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, I'll speak again. And at that time, I want to, I will want to explore a number of things. The chief of staff said tonight about his close relationship with the GDF. And Gail Tishera mentioned the crime period, the difficult period. And I want to explore how in that difficult period, when the leadership of the army did not support the fight against the criminals who were 
massacring people. How we had to navigate that difficult period and Roger Luncheon was at the center of it. To keep the people of this country safe when the people who had, were vested by your constitution and laws to protect them did not do their job. And today, I see many of them in the public domain. They still have a lot to say, but they have a very sordid history of neglect of responsibility. And um, so there are lots of things we may wish to explore that might be uncomfortable truths. We need to explore. People talk it about a different era. In the same era, yes, it was. We didn't have money. And so we had to solve a lot of tasks by being creative. The changes that we have today, the chief of staff is here. If you look at the budget of the army in 1990, the capital budget, it was two million Guyana dollars, less than the salary, an annual salary of one individual in the foreign ministry. One min person in the foreign ministry was earning more per year than the entire capital budget of the army. And if you don't believe me, go to the estimates and you will see, you will see that figure there and I will name the individual who was earning that salary. And so, so today we have, tonight I want to talk a bit more about party, we can talk about government. Our party had to make changes over the period to be relevant. They have something going on there? Is a music or something they're playing in there? Oh, it's on the street, I thought, in the convention center that they're playing music. Yes, so we had to make changes. Over the years, a party remains relevant if it sticks to its core principles, but it, it changes, it constantly refreshes itself in terms of leadership. And Roger has had a serious role in ensuring that the party keep, kept to its core principles, which is respect for people, working class, of Guyana being the priority for our party, remaining a multi-ethnic party, open party. This is, these are the core principles of the party. But we had to make changes today. And if you look at the party's leadership, you would see that we have constantly given young people, his support for young people in this party has led to us being a dynamic party, a party that can withstand anything today with a, a new group of leaders. Still having some of the older comrades there, but we've been able to transition the, to this more open form of, of leadership, largely because of luncheon. As I said before, on Tuesday, we'd explore many things. June, I was, yes, I was on that trip. I just got um, appointed as minister. It was 1993. And we visited several countries. And um, Pauline was on it and Rohi. I, have, I don't want to tell Rohi's story tonight on that trip. But this, uh, that was luncheon and I, refused to do what Rohi did. Should I tell this story, Rohi? Now, in, we are staying in the state guest house in China. And um, we went to breakfast in the morning. So they laid out the table and um, 
there is a purple flower with five petals on each of the, the, the plates. So I, um, I said to Roger, you're eating that? Roger said, no. I said, I'm not eating it too. Oh, he said, I'm the foreign minister. You all don't have any sophistication. So he dutifully took out his knife and fork and had difficulty separating the petals and ate the flower. Now from there, I left, I left the team in, in China and I went to Japan. We were, doing, we were negotiating a five megawatt power plant for, for West Coast and I flew back and caught them up in Malaysia. So I saw the flower appeared again. They laid out there. And then the Chinese people were there. They took the flower, put it in a bowl of water, and then washed their hands with it. <laughs> so we refused to do what he did. And then, June, we came to your house one evening because we were missing Guyanese food. And you cooked some food for us, too, there. And then we're staying again in, now in India, we're staying in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, which is the presidential palace. So be, when we arrived, you know, the new country, new smell. So I started smelling things. They're not smelling the same way. There's a big cake in my room. I smell the cake. I said, I'm not eating. You know, in about three seconds, Roger ate the whole cake. <laughs> so the, these are huge rooms. And, um, and they're very cold. It was like January, so it's winter time in India. And very, very cold. So I saw some people, I said, can you find me a heater to put the heater in my room? At about one in the morning, luncheon dragged his mattress over to my room and slept on the floor. This is in the palace in India because he was too cold in, in his room. But there are lots of other things I... Um, and then when we came back from the trip, you recall Vera at that time, Channel 28, was saying that we were having sex with young boys. That you remember that, the lies that they told. We have been subjected to all sorts of vilification and lies throughout our history. At the race, at, from race, about the party being racist, and then all sorts of personal vilification over that period. And they spread a rumor, and then they campaign on it all the time. This is, that was an, a very, like, every president had a different style. So Roger served all of them. And for that, to serve presidents with different styles, meant you had to be nimble enough to accommodate this style and be effective. I recall when I went to the presidency, so the cabinet meetings used to go from eight in the morning to about six in the evening. And I said, cabinet meetings will go no longer than four hours. And you had a number of people that said, Oh, I'm departing from Chetty and Janet legacy. Now, there's nothing like legacy in the length of meetings. But, you know, people are very glib, like loose with words. And uh, there were big complaints about it, etc. And then we ended up doing, getting more business done in four hours. And often the meetings ended before the four hours had expired. And uh, this is how it was. They, so some presidents, th th this is not just that. I have another example. But I'm using Rohi, but Roger was just like that too. To give you an example of how, like, Roger was very powerful in the office of the president. But he knew how to to navigate experience. Like I went to a heads of government meeting with Rohi. And 
where he would go into his briefcase and do like this. It's like this, and pull out one sheet of paper and put it in front of me when an issue comes up. So I said to him, I just turned president. And Roger was like this too, small briefs to me. And I said, give me the whole, and I use an expletive, I wouldn't use it tonight, the whole file, because that's how he used to treat Comrade Janet Jag and Clement James. A single piece of paper in front of you, so you're reflecting um, his view. There, there are lots of, lots of good things, the debates. I, I can't speak about everything. Some things will go to the grave with us. <clears throat> Luncheon took them to the grave. There are lots of things at, to, in the history of this country and how we navigated through very contentious spirit that we'll have to all take to the grave. But Roger Luncheon has been central to everything, everything that has happened thus far under almost all PPP governments. And he has been a very important person for the party. I'm, I'm sure that he'll be missed by everyone, and we want to thank the family um, for his, because I know if he spent all his time at the office of the president, he did so, at, he was neglecting someone. Maybe not willfully, but that was, as June said, he was a workaholic. Every minute of his day was spent in service to the people of this country, and for which we in the People's Progressive Party grateful. I, I think Dr. Luncheon would be happy to see the PPP of today, when a few afro ghanese who stood tall, had to stand tall in our history, um, in the early days when they were vilified, they're still being vilified, but they had to be strong and resilient to withstand that vilification. Today, there are thousands of afro Guyanese in our party, um, formerly members of this party, much, much more than the, the tough period when he entered this party, and they're making a significant contribution to changing this country and fighting racism. And he probably would have, had the help permitted it, would have been very excited to see that himself about the changes in our party because that's what, from Cherry Jagan days, that was what we always hoped for. So th thank you very much for being here tonight. And I hope that on Tuesday that many of you attend his funeral. Thank you very much. So much for flower power. <laughs> and the one cheater. So we could move on now. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would wish to uh, pay tribute to Dr. Luncheon? Kelowan Lal, would you? Then, um, you could indicate by, by just a show of hands, just stand on the side here. Th th thank you very much, uh, Commit Chairman, Mr. President, um, all the former presidents, Mr. Vice President, all the ministers, my friends, thank you very much. <coughs> Unfortunately, I'm here with a lot of friends except the best one. Um, what I admire about Dr. Luncheon, working with him practically every day in the early period of um, the PEP government with um, Dr. Cherry Chagan, was that <clears throat> although we all knew him as friend and as comrade, 
and as Kamal Jagdo said, he was, or somebody said, he was like the, the soldier at the door of the president. And while I see people coming to him and pleading with him to do this and to do that, because we are long friends and we are comrades, Royal Richard London showed a different face when he was in the office of the president. He was a very tough person. We all know him as a good friend. But when it came to the work of the government, Dr. Lonchon knew what exactly was his role at that period in time in 1992. He knew that we won the election in a very slight margin, small margin. He knew what was the composition of the public service. He knew what was the composition of the police force, the army. And he constructed for himself, as an aide to Dr. Chedi Jagan, a role which he very carefully crafted in such a way that he, as a single person in this new PP government, was able to stand by Chedi Jagan and the government and the cabinet and bring all those things, all those people together, single handedly being a right-hand man of the president in those days. And it took a lot of thought, took a lot of um, maneuverability to be able to bring all these people who at that point in time were seemingly against the government, to bring them to work along with the PUP government, to work to our programs. He was able to talk to, in our presence, in the office of the president, with leading people who we knew were supposedly stumbling blocks, agreeing with Dr. Luncheon to work along with us, work along with the program of Dr. Cherry Jagan. And as the Vice President said, and he didn't go much into it, there's a lot of things that um, he had to do very quietly in the office of the President, sometimes up to two, three o'clock in the morning, with key individuals within the public service, within the army, within the police force, and to talk to them and to get them to be on our side. He didn't give up. He didn't say, okay, these are people, anti-PPP people, or this or that, and all these, they were probably involved in this and that. He brought them to the table, and he allowed Dr. Chedi Jagan those few very successful years of governance while he was alive. And he was a key person in bringing the PPP to a lot of doors which were close to us. Close to us for many, many years because we used to talk to people, do a lot of things to people, give them house lots, give them this and that. But when we were talking to them, there was a stone wall, everything was bouncing back. But Dr. Larger Luncheon was like an auger for the PPP. He was able to penetrate a lot of these barriers, and many of those people are today staunch PPP supporters, and he brought them on board. So, Doc, I want to say farewell. You, um, you give us a life of excellence to this country and to the party, and we, as your friends still here, we would all like to strive to accomplish at least a small part that you have been able to accomplish and to give to this country and to the party. Thank you very much. The guy in the short jack. Oh, prop. You would like to say a few words, please. All protocols observe. Um, I met, I heard of Dr. Lanchan while I was studying in Moscow, and when I returned to Guyana in 1988 after studies, I was living in Bel Air, wanted to join a party group. The guy said, join Camberville, and I had more friends in Camberville group, Barry, Fata, Dave, and so. Dr. Luncheon was a chairman of Camberville Group, a position he held for over three, nearly three decades. And on Sundays, because he was a medical doctor at the time, 
he would come in early and I would come early and the two of us will have to wait until the others arrive before he start meeting. He was always early. And I asked him one time when he was alone, what motivates you to join the PBP? And one of his motivation that he, while being a student at Howard University, and it was also the alma mater for Dr. Jagan, Dr. Jagan was given a lecture there and he was very impressed with the presentation. Two of his favorite words was banners and niggers. And he don't say it in derogatory term, the niggers. So he tell me banners when Cherry spoke there about the civil rights movement, about the recession and the depression. If you see how these niggers listen carefully, a pin could drop and he could listen. So when he came to Guyana, he was always looking for an avenue to get to the PVP. He told me two female comrades introduced him to Dr. Jagan. And now June indicated that she was one of those persons. And now June was a confident of Dr. Luncheon. Now, Dr. Luncheon served as a doctor. He was well respected in the medical profession. I remember in the 90s, I had to get a form filled, a medical form. He told me, come early because don't make me start the chores. I'm going to sign it up for you. So I waited by the gate. When I waited there, as he came with his bicycle, from the guard right down to the cleaners, to the nurses, to the doctors, everybody, good morning, doctor, good morning, doc. Each one he passed told him good morning. And it is something you earn as a professional. It's not given to you, that respect that he had. When he served in, the, when the government changed in 1992, he was on the platform, fully on the campaign trail. I don't think he enjoyed anything more than being on that platform when he's speaking. So much so that when the PVP won the election in 1992, Malcolm Paris told me that the trailblazer for the PVP in winning that election was Dr. Luncheon. He was a trump card for the PVP. I would never forget him in 1997 because the two speakers, main speakers, were really flat speakers. And with him on the platform, he would work that crowd up. He hit that platform and he, was, he came out uh, with a fascinating story. He said, come December 15, comrades, it will be final exam for the PNC. If they can't do it now, they can't make it anymore. So Dr. Luncheon on the platform in medicine has really excelled. And one thing about him is his humanity. I remember when the government changed in 1992, I asked him, I was at the central bank, I can't get a, a, a stay at the government flats they, if there is any vacancy. He said, hold on, I'm going to see why you, if there is anything, I'm going to help you. Well, there were people who were debating, you're not entitled to that because you work at Bank of Guyana and Comrade Com Com Barrett would know that piece that he called me in and he said, look, Prof, come and collect the key, and if anybody tell you to move, don't move. Is I giving you the key and you stay there. And that was the kind of character. He go out of his way to help somebody, and he stick with his position. I think he has set the bar so high in this country that it will take hard work from those who are coming through, both the medical and the political, the medical and politics now, to emulate him in his practice. So what all I just want to say is rest in peace, Doc. Your good work shall live on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Is there anyone else in the audience who would wish to say a few words? Pandit? His name is not really Pandit, it's really Kim Sharma. Well, I, I don't know if Komarohi is accurate to say in Kim, because my friend, uh, Nobat, used to call me Kwame, and that name has stuck for a long time too. So I don't know who I am really, but I can tell you that when we first met, when I first came in contact with Dr. Luncheon, it was at the Michael Ford bookshop, I saw him there, and he was a young, well, I didn't know he was a doctor and so on, but he, we were we were looking through the same kind of books, African Communists, one of the magazines that I found very interesting, and he was standing there with maybe a few friends, and we started a conversation. He told me he's living in Kitty, so I begged him for a drop home, 
At the time, he did have a car, as far as I'm aware. I think it was a Lancer. There's some, right? Something strange about the Lancer. One day, he told me they broke that little triangle glass. These guys don't have that right. And I said, Doc, what they stole? He said, Why? If I tell you, the thief my bread. You know, they went to the car, they stole that guy bread. And those, day, those days, bread was, you know, serious. But when he saw me and we were going, I said to him, I said, Doc, why you don't join the, w, the WPA? Because I thought he was a young black comrade. He was looked very enthusiastic. And he was adamant. He said, you, I, I, why, why WP? I want to join the PPP. I applied to join the PPP. And I told my friend, Foto, Amar Ramsuk. Amar said, bring him right to win the Camelville group. And that's how we came into the Camelville group. Because the Kitty group where we lived was not functioning at the time. It had belonged to Commandant Bala Pussar when I came back from East Germany after a year still there. Um, I, my friend Amar took me to the Camelville group. And we had the most vibrant group in Guyana at the time. We thought it was the, the premier group after we were challenging Belay Group, where our premier, Dr. Jago, was. So I want to say this because it was Dr. Lanchon who, when he met me, he said, you know, you remind me of my friend who died in the States. We had an accident. And that's, what his, that's why his eyes were affected. Then I knew he had a cut on his eye. And he said, you know, you know, you remind me of, and since then, that friendship has grown into a family relation. He would come home by me. He loved to listen to my mother. By the way, she's 95 years old now, and my father's 97, and he had deep respect for them. My father would always be very, very stern. He is afraid of the PPP because he came through those days when we were viewed as terrorists. So, he would, he would look at Dr. Lodge in a very you know, strong way because he does not, but he was very surprised. But my mom was very, very close to him. At one time, I remember when his baby born, he came, he said, pa he said Pandit. He's the first person to call me Pandit, and it stuck. <laughs> you know, so when he said, when Commodore Lowe, he said Pandit, it was when people came to him and asked about Pandit, he knew me. When they said Kami, Kim, and all these things, he never knew who they were talking about. And I had a lot of personal relations, uh, relationships with him I don't want to spend time talking about. When my son, my eldest son, uh, took him with seizures at 14 years, I went to about a mouse meeting. He was cheering in Campbellville. We had meetings. And I told him after the meeting, I said, Doc, you know, my son went and he had about three or four seizures. He said, bring him right to me. And I took him, and he diagnosed him to be MRI treated. I met him at the office of the president. He gave me special accommodation to go to MRI. When I came back, I said, Doc, you know, I can't pay for this thing. I can't ma manage an MRI. Thing. He said, you don't worry about that. So there were, there were some very touching moments that we've had. But we were family, family. When Shaka born, he said, he said, Padish, you know, Shaka is like a baby in my hands. He was premature. And he said, can your mom look after him so that I can get to work? And my father would never allow it. You know, but that is the kind of relationship we have. I think I should say this because he came to my wedding, and I strongly suspect now, thinking about it, that we, I did not invite him, but he brought the whole party group, the whole Canva group, to my wedding. And I was shocked because I was accused by Common Janet, who also came, and there was this big outriders. And she came down and she said, Bandit, you didn't invite me to your wedding. I, I, I was like flabbergasted. I said, Common Janet. I don't know, I could invite a president to my wedding. You know, I, I'm not that kind of rich person. And she went upstairs and ate with a leaf, and she, took, she made my mother take all the, the food, and she ate, she sent, him, she sent Gerald Beaton to buy a gift. I don't want to go into that. We are a family, and that's why I come to love the PP because it is a big family. And um, when I saw Dr. Lord Chen at the last campaign with Comrade, the president here, I said, Lonchon is still here, no matter what. He told me, I took him home by me because we had lost contact for a long time. And he told me, he said, you know, I was scared I was dying before, but we, I got over it. And he lived for quite a few years. He said, I've inherited a gene from my family that has caused me to lose control of the muscles in my body. And that is why I'm suffering from this. It was a family gene that was a negative gene. And he was explaining that to me. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Komu Chama. Uh, this is the time, those of you who wish to say uh, a few words about in homage to Dr. Luncheon, that you're free to do so, to step forward. Yes. Excellency, the President, Prime Minister, um, Vice President, former President, Cabinet to colleagues, and number of parliamentarians who are here. Um, I generally don't take the opportunity to speak at, and of course the family, the family of uh, Dr. Luncheon. I generally don't take the time to speak at events where there's a reflection for persons who would have died because I know that it's more appropriate for the family members to share their stories, their time with us. This one is a little bit different and I wanted to, I feel that it would be missing if I didn't share a, a few experiences that I've had because I was very close to Dr. Luncheon and I'd say, say a little bit about how that happened. First of all, Dr. Luncheon was a, a mythical type of person. Even before you met him, you heard about him. And during the period when former president and now vice president was president, he had assumed the most powerful role an HPS had ever had in this country. So much so that many times I heard uh, former president refer to Dr. Luncheon as a governmentalist. But because he had assumed this really powerful role, one thing that was always, that stood out in relation to how he treated everyone else and himself was that he was never arrogant, he was always humble, and he always emphasized service. I had the privilege because of the opportunity that former President and Vice President Barra Jagdeo had given me in relation to the job that I had at the Office of the President. He had given Roger some particular um, responsibility in the work that I was doing. Roger took his work very, very seriously. And for many of the young people who are here, there's some very important lessons that he taught me. I had about four years of working for him directly and every day I would come into the office, he was there almost every single time. Even when I was trying to beat him into the office early, he was there before me. Only to discover that he was in the office at four o'clock in the morning. Now, Every time I'd peep open, push open the door, I would see him at his desk. If he's busy, he would look at me and then look away. Means, don't bother me right now. He's taking care of emails, taking care of documents. But when he had the time, and this is something that Minister Gale also took the time to do, which was to invest in young people. You remember when we had the first experience, the first conversation, you, ta you taught me about the word stickability. And I still use that word today. But Roger taught me three things that I wanted to share with the young people here today, and I think because it, it should live on. One was he spoke about process. And nothing that you can learn in opposition will ever prepare you for the work of government. But even then, when he was teaching about process. Today, I know the value of how important process is. Second, he spoke about track record. Whenever 
he was speaking in relation to whether it was politics or government, he would always talk about track record. Why that's important is because the People's Progressive Party has always had its track record in improving the lives and the livelihood of the people of this country, of which he played an important part. Many times, the detractors would always try to diminish and claim a degree of superiority, especially at the beginning when it was believed, as he said to me, that the People's Progressive Party would not last one term in government. That is what was believed. It said that we were, didn't have the capability, the capacity to lead this country and to, be, to run a government. Because of him and many of the persons who are here, Comrade Rohi, Comrade Sam, Comrade Barrett, Comrade Gale, Peck, many, many others who are not here today and who, are, have, who, have been, who were involved, they showed this country what this People's Progressive Party can do, and we are all living on the success of what happened since then. The last thing that Roger taught me was perspective. So government is always very fast-paced, especially when you are trying to do so many things. And at the time when I had my first experience, President Jack Dio was in his final term, so he was doing a million things uh, to get completed before the end of his time. Nothing has changed today. Um, but what he taught me was perspective that when it looks as though things are so busy and so wrong happening right now, that the long-term perspective and the long-term view about what you are trying to achieve is how you make the right decisions and how you get the right analysis so that you can withstand a lot of the rough patches that governments always face. I want to take the opportunity before I conclude to just say to the family, Shalene and all of the others who I know and some of the others that I don't know, that I want to thank you for sharing your time with us and sharing Roger with us, I can say with almost certainty that had it not been for the investment that many of the other leaders, which includes Roger, had they not made it then, many of us won't be standing here today. So from a personal standpoint and from a party organization standpoint, I'd like to say thank you to both the family and to Roger himself. He means more to me and to us and this country than most people would ever really imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Ramson. Well, we have space to accommodate one more speaker. Are there any takers? Oh, is there anyone from the is there anyone from the family who would wish to? I see the family sitting there. Yes. I recognize Rashida. I haven't seen Rashida for ages. How are you, Rashida? Good. Is there anyone from the family row who wish to say? No. All right, well, I just have, oh, please. This is, um, this is Tamika or Tandika? 
Oh. Come. This, 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 this girl, I know this girl is a baby. <laughs> She's really grown. All right. Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> Um, good night, everyone, Mr. President, Vice President, Ministers, former Presidents, good evening. Um, so I didn't come here intending to say anything. However, we've heard so much about my father in terms of his work, his duty, the country to the Guyanese society, but we haven't heard so much about him as a father. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a daddy's girl. I'm his last child, and I loved him more than anything. Um, up to now, my husband says, your father raised all his girl children to feel that they don't need no man. <laughs> all of y'all think y'all are the men in these relationships. And, you know, while maybe to my spouse that might come across as something a little too much or a bit aggressive, I think my father would be proud <laughs> to know that he has raised independent young women. He has empowered us. He has done his best to give us the type of education that he thinks was deserving. But one thing that I want to say tonight, you know, my father taught me a lot about respect. He always made sure that I knew, or I knew that I was just like any other person just because I carry the title luncheon or my father may have been a politician or a public figure, I was better than the one. And not for one day did he ever let any of his children run away. He did not believe in nepotism and he was very clear about that. I did have one story I wanted to share. I knew that I was going to study medicine since I was probably maybe 13 years old. Hadn't even read CXC. And my father sat me down and said, Depending on your results for CXC, the government may or may not grant you a scholarship. If you do bad, I will ask no favors. I do have a friend who has a security company, and all he requires is a sound primary education. And I'm quite sure you have that. Luckily, I was successful at my CXCs, and I was granted a scholarship by the government of Guyana to study medicine in Cuba. And I think that when me and my sister both graduated as medical doctors, it was something that was very close to my father's heart because even though he had moved from the hospital into politics, medicine was still very close and dear to his heart. Um, I'm a little upset that I had to share my father and I didn't get him that much, but I don't think I could have asked for a better father, even with the amount of hours that he put in that did reflect on his family time. I think he tried his best, and I think all of his children were very happy to be called his. Thank you very much. It was so wonderful to see how these girls have grown to professional young women and could speak so and articulate their view so well, just like their father did. But I know these girls as babies, Roger used to fetch them and carry them all over the place, including Rashida too, sitting there. Yeah. Um, so I think that, is there anyone else from the family who would wish to say anything? Okay, good. So, due respect to that request, not to say anything. Ladies and gentlemen, President, Vice President, former President, all other dignitaries present here. Um, I think the Vice President and the General Secretary who spoke in that capacity said a very important point which we have to bear in mind, which is that the party has always felt it necessary to hold activities of this type whenever, you know, comrades who made a sterling contribution to the struggle and to government as well would have passed on. And this is very important from an educational point of view because there are many things that we may not have known about Dr. Luncheon, 
that came out in the contributions made here this afternoon. I myself did know some things about Dr. Luncheon. So as the old saying goes, it's never too late to learn. I think we need to thank and congratulate the leadership of the People's Progressive Party and the General Secretary for seeing it necessary to organize this activity, the inclement weather notwithstanding, and to, in order to bid farewell in this public fashion to a comrade who we love dearly and who we honor as well in the name of Dr. Luncheon. And as the Vice President and the GS announced just now, um, the President and others, and including the GS, and others will be speaking on Tuesday. Uh, so fasten your safety belt, um, get ready for the speeches. General Secretary has already alerted that he wants to explore some issues which people might be uncomfortable with, but it's important from an educational point of view. So we'll hear from the President and the Vice President and other dignitaries on Tuesday, and I would wish to extend an invitation to all of you to be present at that function so that we bid farewell to our beloved Dr. Roger Luncheon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending, and you may wish to uh, mix and mingle and talk, exchange views with each other. Thank you very much.